Before we get started in our Bible study, today's teaching content is rated PG-13, um, Pastor G-13. Parental guidance really is suggested, though, all kidding aside, because the content we're going to be looking at today um, might be um, difficult for young ears. So we have a wonderful children's ministry, and if you want to take advantage of our children's ministry, just go right down the hallway, and somebody will be glad to help you, because I strongly urge you to probably remove young children from the sanctuary today. If you're watching online and you have young children in the room, put veggie tails on the, in the next room <laughs> and send the kids there, because the content is, um, it's delicate and um but it's truthful and look i have to give an account before the lord one day and so i want to be able to say that i have faithfully discharged all of god's word um but some of you are going to have a hard time hearing some of this in fact i had some people get up and leave in the first service it's okay um i don't really think it's a good sermon unless somebody gets up and leaves <laughs> so uh you know that's That's where I am. Um, but I will, my commitment to you is to teach this truthfully, but also sensitively and graciously. If you decide to get up and leave, that's your choice. If you decide to be mad, that's your choice. But I must tell you what God says, which is very contrary to what our culture says. And sometimes when people have really embraced what the culture says, then they think anything that is contrary to that is hate speech or is, you know, a difficult and they don't like it. And OK, uh, can I tell you, you know, I've been a Christian now for some 45 years and there's plenty of times I read the Bible. I go, oh, wow, that's hard. That's hard. But it's good for me. And it's important for all of us to hear the parts of the Bible that are wonderful and the parts of the Bible that are challenging. And these are some challenging verses. So um, just, just know that. My heart is to teach it with sensitivity and with grace, but also to be very truthful with you. So to do anything less would be to deny you uh, God's best and God's word. So, so thank you for being here this morning. With that, I see some of you have come back for bad news. So congratulations. Um, if you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. If you were not here last week, um, we started into the book of Romans and the book of Romans in the first several chapters has some bad news. It has some bad news about the human condition. But as I said last week, we have to hear the bad news first before we can appreciate and see our need for the good news. Very, very similar to the way when you go to the doctor, you don't always like to hear the bad news. The diagnosis can be difficult to hear, but the cure is so wonderful. And so the doctor has to say, here's the bad news, but here's the good news. We have a cure for this and you can be helped. And so that's the way we're approaching the first few chapters of Romans. First three chapters, there's a lot of bad news. But chapter four, you start to hear the good news and you can't really understand, appreciate the good news, nor see your need for it unless you really understand the first three chapters. So we're going slowly here and it might be painfully slow uh, for us, but we must hear the bad news about the human condition. And why is this important? Because the world's narrative on the human condition is very different from God's narrative. The world's narrative on the human condition is basically this. That man is basically good. That's the world's narrative. Man is basically good. With a few exceptions, there are some outliers that the world generally agrees with. You know, the Hitlers, the Idi Amins, the Stalins, the Osama Bin Ladens. But besides people like that, man is basically good. And what you need to do is continue to do what you can to improve your good condition. And then you're good to go. It's all about being good and good condition and being good to go. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible has a very different narrative on the human condition. God's narrative is basically this, that man is not good, man is bad. And man is bad because we are sinful people. 
We are born with a sin nature and we sin because of our sin nature. And thus we disobey God constantly because we're bad. See, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart and only Jesus can change that. Does everybody understand that? And so God says, let me tell you about the human condition. Mankind is basically bad, not basically good. And mankind needs a savior. And that's why I sent my son, Jesus. And that, that part, that last part there is, is the good news. But again, you won't see your need for Jesus and appreciate why he came unless we first understand our bad nature, the bad news. And because everybody is bad, if God had not sent his son Jesus to rescue us and to save us, we would be subject to God's wrath. God sent Jesus to actually save us from the wrath that we all deserve. Now, wrath is one of the words that is used in the book of Romans, and we talked about it last week. If you have your Bibles there in Romans 1, look again at verse 18, first use of the word wrath. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And I pointed out last week that the word wrath is uh, the Greek word in the original New Testament language, orge. It is found 12 times in Romans. That's more times than any other book in the Bible. Slight exception is the book of Revelation. It mentions it 13 times. But Revelation has many more chapters than Romans, so proportionally it is true to say that, at least proportionally, the word wrath is found in Romans more than any other New Testament book. And it means God's righteous anger, his divine indignation, and just punishment in response to human sin. And so in the first two chapters... Paul is going to talk about three bad categories of people and that all human beings fall into one or multiple categories. I mentioned uh, these categories last week, the unrighteous, the self-righteous, and the over-righteous. And Paul goes on to tell us that thankfully, God reveals himself to each of these three categories in unique ways so that mankind has no excuse. Because God is intentional about trying to reach people within these three various categories. To deny him becomes our choice. Not because of the absence of the existence of God. God makes himself plain to people. And in terms of the unrighteous, and that's all we're going to talk about further today. Uh, we're not going to get to the other two categories un until the next uh, week or two. So you got to keep coming back for more bad news, friends. But anyway, uh, the, the unrighteous, we, we focused on last week. And, and, and again, all of us in some sense fall under this one generic category. Because there's an unrighteous, no, not one. Paul will say that in Romans. But he's primarily talking about the, those who have zero knowledge of God and the Bible, those who rarely, if ever, attend church, uh, those who are the misinformed or the uninformed about God and the Bible and, and all of this. And, and in this category would fall that the guy on the island. You know, what about the person who's never heard, somebody in some remote place who's never heard? And God says, but they have heard because my existence is undeniable. And what is it that God uses to reach the unrighteous well, Paul tells us, we talked about it last week, creation. It, God is visible in creation. His handiwork is evident so that you cannot deny that he exists. And then once you realize you can't deny God exists, now you're accountable to him. And, and verse 20 in your Bibles there, uh, Paul writes, for since the creation, the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God reveals himself in creation. This is why David would write in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they pour forth knowledge. And so God, God's existence is evident in creation. And so that's where we left off. We're going to talk now about what Paul says, by God's inspiration, is the natural fallout in a culture when you deny God. A godless society will look like what he describes here 
and what we're about to read, and you're going to say, it, this sounds like the news feed on my phone. Yeah, it, it does. But let's first pause there and pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We pray, God, that you would use it to speak to our hearts, that you would shape us and mold us, Lord, into your image more and more, that we would be surrendered to you and, and to be more like Jesus. And for those who don't know you, I pray today, God, that they would open their hearts to you. For those who are struggling in, in different sin issues, Lord, that they would find forgiveness at the foot of the cross and, and that people would have ears to hear what, what they're going to hear today, to, to not be offended, Lord, because your truth is, is necessary for us to hear because you love us and you, you want us to know the truth because if we know the truth, the truth will set us free. And so that's our hope and prayer today, Lord. Use your word now to speak to us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So here's the deal, church. When, when mankind removes God from the equation, then mankind will resort to his base nature. And man's base nature is pretty perverse. And so what we read here in the first chapter of Romans is God describes what happens when people deny him and disobey him, despite the fact that he's very real and very um, visible in the sense of he's undeniable and that we are accountable to him. And so God basically says, and this is what Paul is going to write here, we're going to read it in a minute. God basically says, if you want to remove me, you want to deny me, you want to disobey me, then I will give you over to your base nature. And then you will see how miserable you are. And then hopefully then you will cry out to me. And, and so look with me in your Bibles here at Romans 1. I'm going to start verse 24 down through the end of the chapter. Romans 1 verse 24, therefore God also gave them up. You're going to see that phrase repeated a total of three uh, mentioned a total of three times god also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of god for the lie and worshiped and served the creature or the created things rather than the creator who was blessed forever amen and for this reason god gave them up there's the verse again to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use, talking about sexual desires, for what is against nature. Verse 27, likewise also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, here's the third time, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those, look, notice that, affirm those who practice them. Again, this is like reading the news feed on my phone. This describes our own culture. Because when man removes God from the equation, then the result is <clears throat> a very amoral and immoral culture. <clears throat> Three times in this passage, Verse 24, 26, and 28, it says that God gave them over or gave them up to their base nature. Look at the third time that that phrase is used. Again, in verse 28, verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. 
debased, a debased mind. Now, some of your translations say a depraved mind. Other translations say a reprobate mind. Uh, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and the word for debased to describe the mind of those, this is what happens when culture removes God, then it becomes this immoral place with a debased mind. The Greek word debased is adakimos, adakimos. Now, it is from two Greek words. The A, the prefix on adakimos, makes a word negative in the Greek. Dokimos means to test something or to try something to prove its worth and value. In the Greek culture, when a man was battle tested, it, it, it would, it, he would be referred to as dokimos. This is, this is someone who was, who was proved battle ready and valuable to the army, dokimos. When they would test metal to determine the value of precious metal, they would use that term, dokimos, when it would be tested and proved to be valuable. So now in this use where God says, when a culture removes me, I give them over to a dokimos mind, meaning ah, the negative, it has proven the mind to become unworthy and without value. When a culture gives in to the culture instead of honoring and submitting to God, God says, I give you over to a debased mind. A dakamos, just a mind that is without worth or value. Now, in modern words, we, we would say this. Someone who is, has a, a dakamos mind is someone who has lost their ever-loving mind, okay? And I don't know about you, but in the last year or so, I've been using that phrase to describe the world in which we live, I don't know how many times. People have lost their ever-loving minds. You look around, you go... What is going on? Is this crazy or what? Who would do this? Who would think this? Why would they practice that? The world has lost its ever-loving mind. That's a dokimos. That's what Paul is saying here. Case in point, look at verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, not a lie. There is a main lie that is circulating in our culture. Paul's writing this in the first century. <clears throat> I mean, times haven't changed. They've only worsened. Paul says, you start living like this, then I'm going to give them over to a debased mind, and people are going to start to dishonor their bodies, and they're going to believe the lie, the lie that the culture is teaching. So case in point, examples. To believe that he can be she, and she can be he, and anyone can be they, <laughs> friends, that's dishonoring their bodies. That is exchanging the truth of God for a lie. To no longer refer to women who give birth as mothers, but instead now referring to them as birthing people. Have you heard this? The Biden administration has changed the language in the HHS budget from mothers to birthing people. The government is stamping this new term on the HHS budget in order to make accommodation for Women who identify as men who can still have babies, but who say they are not women anymore. So now the terminology has changed to birthing people. And that is dishonoring their bodies and exchanging the truth of God for the lie. Some of you are probably, or many of you are familiar with the term conversion therapy. It's also referred to as reparative therapy. Conversion therapy is a counseling approach to help someone heal from the wounds that might have led to same-sex attraction. And the medical community, had, the secular, I should, I should say, the secular medical professional psychological community has dismissed reparative or conversion therapy as something that is, quote, emotionally damaging 
and dangerous to try to help someone heal from whatever might have led to same-sex attraction. Many of the secular professionals call that emotionally damaging and dangerous. And yet, the very same ones who say that conversion therapy is emotionally damaging and dangerous are the very same professionals who say that puberty-blocking drugs, hormone treatments, chemical castration, and surgical reassignments are normative, reasonable, and rational. That is dishonoring their bodies and exchanging the truth of God for the lie. And how familiar are we with allowing now biological boys and men to compete in girls' and women's sports while shaming women athletes like Riley Gaines, who was here a few months ago, to say nothing about ignoring Title IX, who object to men and boys competing in girls' and women's sports. That is dishonoring their bodies and exchanging the truth of God for a lie. When Paul was writing this in the first century, do you remember who the emperor was of Rome? The Roman emperor at this time was Nero. He's writing things about how debased people become, how depraved people become, how they dishonor their bodies, how they accept the lie. Nero was guilty. Even as Paul wrote in his day, Nero, if you know your history, Nero was married a few times. One of his wives died tragically. Some historians say Nero killed her by kicking her when she was pregnant. But they're not certain, but she died. This is what they are certain about. And after she died, Nero took a young boy, prepubescent boy, had him castrated and married him in 67 AD. Now you know why I said PG-13 content, right? Married him in 67 AD. Do you know, again, times haven't changed. It just, you know, takes on new definitions. Do you know, if you're not aware, you need to know, that there is a movement the past few years, among some in the secular professional therapy community who are trying to replace the word pedophile, and instead of calling someone a pedophile, relabeling them now minor attracted person, MAP for short, minor attracted person. You can go onto the NIH website today. I did in preparation for this. You can go on the NIH website and they talk about how using the term minor attracted person instead of pedophile is, quote, less divisive and, quote, less stigmatizing. And it will become something that is more acceptable. And the reason I can say that with confidence is because when you allow any sexual deviation to be tolerated and then celebrated, you have to allow all sexual deviation at some point. If you allow any, th there's no way to shut the door on that. So as heartbreaking as this is for us to talk about this, this is the kind of thing that Paul is writing here. All of this, and much more th than the examples I'm giving, is reflective of a culture that has lost its ever-loving mind. And why? Why has this happened? I'll tell you why. Because the enemy has worked hard. The enemy has worked hard while the church has been hardly working. Being asleep. Asleep in the pulpits. Asleep in the pews. And thus God has been removed from the conscience of a culture. But folks, listen. We don't have to buy into the lie. We don't have to believe the lie. I hope you don't. We can stand firm in our faith and Christians can still lead the way with grace and truth. And we must. <laughs> Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul would write, I am not ashamed for I am persuaded that he is able to guard what I have committed to him until that day. Paul goes on to say that when you remove God from the equation, it opens the door to all kinds of sexual deviation. Verses 26 and 27. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, vile, 
For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Friends, despite what the world has tolerated, elevated, and celebrated, God calls homosexuality, just in this passage, vile, unnatural, shameful. And it doesn't matter that the world has legitimized, normalized, or even legalized it. God's view on the matter is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't bend to cultural redefinitions, and neither should the church. Because if we do, the number one, we dishonor God. And number two, we deprive people with same-sex attraction of the good news of God's grace, forgiveness, and wholeness that they can experience in Him if we are too afraid to speak the truth in love. And they need the truth in love. They need the truth and love. Statistically, statistically, the LGBTQ community are some of the unhappiest people in the world. Now, some would say, well, yeah, they're unhappy because people like you, Pastor Gary, are not gay affirming. But if that's true, then why is it when you look at our culture right now, the American culture has been the most accepting and affirming of the LGBTQ community, talking about the general American culture. We're living in a time when that lifestyle has never been as accepted and affirmed as it is today. And yet, and yet, adolescents who identify in the LGBTQ community have a higher suicide rate four times the national average. They also have greater reports of depression six times the national average. So I would submit to you that the reason that is is because whenever we live a lifestyle that is contrary to God's standard, and I mean that for any lifestyle, I mean a homosexual lifestyle, or if you're married and cheating, uh, or, or if you're hooking up before marriage, or drunkenness, whatever the lifestyle is that is contrary to, the, to God's good standard, we make it miserable for ourselves. And what compounds that is when others are affirming us and celebrating us in our sinful choices. It compounds the misery. And so it doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle we're talking about. I mean, Paul's pretty specific here in this passage, but in general, whenever we are living a life that is contrary to God's good standard, his, his righteous standard. We invite hardship. This is what the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 15. The way of the unfaithful is hard. The way of the unfaithful is hard. But Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Okay, that's a, a farming term, a yoke where they would harness oxen together. Jesus says, harness yourself to me. Take my yoke upon you. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. There are a lot of people in this world with a lot of anxiety and depression and, and they're seeking all kinds of things to help medicate that and help resolve that and assuage that. And let me tell you something, there is nothing more satisfying and fulfilling than having a personal relationship with Jesus. He's the one who brings wholeness to the soul. He's the one who brings rest to the weary. He's the one who brings forgiveness to the sinful. His name is Jesus. And I want to spend now the last just couple minutes closing out today by praying for those who are, who are confused about their sexual identity, believing the lie of the enemy, those who are struggling with desires or in a same-sex relationship. I want to pray for family members who are burdened for a loved one, trying to walk that line of grace and truth. And I want to pray for anyone, any of us, in other kinds of sinful lifestyles. 
I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I just want us as a congregation to pray because it's one thing to say, look at how terrible this is that we read and look at how terrible our culture is. And yeah, but there's some hurting people out there that we need to pray for. And there's some hurting people in here we need to pray for. Now, before I do that, I want to close the way I closed last week to just kind of wash over our hearts and minds with a glimpse of the good news. It's Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. I'd like to, for us to say these two verses aloud and together. Would you say them with me? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Father, this is our prayer. Uh, we can read uh, all the ways that our culture has become so depraved and so contrary to your righteous standard, and our hearts are heavy. Lord, our hearts are heavy for those who are believing the lie about their identity. May, may they come to understand and believe and rest in who you created them to be, your beautiful design whether they are male or female, the way that you created them individually, uniquely, with purpose, how you love us all so much that you would die for us. Lord, we pray for those who are either wrestling with attraction or they're in same-sex relationships, God, that you would show them the beauty of the way that you designed sex between a man and a woman in the context of a marriage. And that we would celebrate that in the right way, according to the way that you define it, Lord. Bring them out of that lifestyle, Lord, with hope and healing that they might come to understand that only you can satisfy the deepest longings of our souls. That you make us whole, that you, that you fulfill us in every way as you designed us and created us to be. And I pray for families that are struggling with what to say and how to say it and how to show love and how to be truthful all at the same time. And it's so difficult and confusing. I pray for those families, you'd give them wisdom. I pray that you give them grace and tact and truth all rolled up into one beautiful way of expressing themselves to those that they love. And to any of us, Lord, caught in our own sin living a life that is contrary to your righteous standard. Lord, it begins when we come to you and confess our sins. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we come to you today, Lord, and ask you to cleanse our hearts, forgive us. Thank you that you, even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You died for us to save us, to rescue us from the wrath of God that we might be forgiven and free. And some people just need to hear that today, Lord, that they can be free. They can be free. So, Lord, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Set us all free from whatever binds us, that we might live a life that is honorable and that praises you and that is righteous because of what Christ has done for us, living in us and through us. We commit all this to you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.